embedded disparities that exist within New Zealand are a part of that recovery and restoration. That when we go back to business as usual, it doesn't mean that we ensure that those that have been impacted over a relatively short period, yes, we must make sure that um, their recovery is significant, but this is the time to do really significant reform. I believe it's a, a, a space where we can show real global leadership. So I think particularly in areas like child poverty, um, really thinking around, I, I think as a, as a nation, that's we've had to think about income adequacy in a very different way during the crisis. Mm. Um, it's been a much broader conversation and that conversation is really important for us to think about what those elements of our well-being mean as well. But a whānau-centred, child-centred approach, if I want to think about, you know, I often talk about mokapunatanga, it's I have to have confidence that my grandchildren's grandchildren will live in a time of flourishing. Mm. What needs to be invested now to ensure that they're able to serve later. One of the things that you mentioned in there, Tracy, was making sure that we uh, that we are talking about these things, giving voice to these things, and so we won't end up doing anything differently if we don't have um, those contributions being made at every level. So I wonder if you could both tell me a little bit about the Science Advisor Network that you're part of. It's not something that um, people necessarily know about, but it's such an important part of um, for me, um, for a important part of, of government. So tell us about the roles that you play and your perspective on that uh, Science Advisor Network. Tahu. Oh, so I just joined the Science Advisor Network uh, forum last year um, and uh, it's been a really interesting experience. Like for what, for me, I guess the, there's two great things um, that have come from it. One is the um, ability to sit around a table and have a sort of a shared commitment to knowledge contributing to well-being, whatever that looks like. Um, and also to be able to kind of bring in very different perspectives um, and worldviews on what knowledge looks like, um, on who the holders of knowledge are, um, on who should be the, you know, who can benefit from knowledge. And one of one of the sort of interesting things that I've been involved in the last year is really thinking deeply about, you know, what is the role of Matauranga Māori here um, in the science system? And to think about science in a really inclusive way. You know, I think too many of our tamariki are sort of presented with an image that science is done by people in white lab coats, often white men, <laughs> um, you know, who, who do experiments in their labs. And, you know, that's only a very sort of small minority of, of what science constitutes. Science is, is everywhere. And our tupuna were scientists, like we might not have scientist dad or a scientist in our family, but look back far enough and we have scientists in our ancestry, you know, our ancestors who crossed the vast expanse of Te Moana Nui Akiwa to get here, didn't get here by luck. You know, they had to observe the stars, the winds, the currents. It was a phenomenal feat of science and courage mm. to actually, um, you know, to come here to Aotearoa. So we have science running through our whakapapa, but that message isn't necessarily one that's communicated or um, or really sort of confirmed in meaningful ways for our tamariki in schools. And so even though the Science Advisor Forum is sort of, from looking from the outside, people might think it's sort of a, maybe an elite group of scientists who get to, together and talk about sciencey things. Um, it's not, you know, it's not, a lot of it is thinking about how can science and knowledge in all its diversity benefit our people and what is the role that we might play in that. Um, and so even though I've only been on that forum a short time, it's been incredibly um, useful to be able to be part of those conversations and to also take that back to the communities and the networks um, that I'm involved in and to also bring them into the room. Mm. So I don't really see myself as an expert at all. I'm not an expert. I might do sort of specialist research and population research and I've been trained for that but I don't see myself as an expert, I see myself as a conduit, mm. a conduit of knowledge flows that comes into the forum and that also disseminates outwards. And I'm happy to be a conduit. 
I think people would be perhaps surprised to know that um, from everything from March 15th, 15th to um, Fakari White Island um, uh, to COVID, our science advisory network has played a role. Uh, whether it was um, informing our mental health response and issues of social cohesion, right through to coordinating how we could get a search and rescue response in a safe way on Fakare and COVID-19. Lots of obvious ways science, uh, the research there is impacted, but it's so broad. And, and I, I've been so grateful for that advice. So Tracy, your thoughts on that network? Well, I think, I mean, just picking up on what you just said there, I mean, it is really important in looking at the different responses globally for those that have followed ideological advice, so ideologues really, and those that have followed um, the broad variety of expert advice. And I think that we can see in our response just how effective that has been. And I've, I've certainly been very impressed just how you've been all over the science. And uh, talking to Juliet Gerard, she says, you know, in the beginning, she says, you know, you're, you're going through it, she said, but you know, the prime minister is totally over the science. And, you know, and I think that is a, this really important thing about what we're able to learn, you know, the new lexicons that we all develop under different types of conditions. And this is one of those conditions. So like Tahu, I mean, I've actually been um, on the, the forum for a relatively short period of time uh, since I took up my role as chief science advisor for Ministry of Social Development. And I think one of the things there is it is around the breadth of knowledge. It's around uh, very, very outcome focused. I think it is really important that we recognize that I think more expertise, more needs to be pulled in. And for me, it really m makes us want to always sort of rethink, problematize who are the experts. Mm. Um, and some may have that in disciplinary. We certainly know there's so many that have it through lived experience. Um, and that's a really important element to sort of, to really think about that, about who are the sort of the knowledge champions? What does knowledge transfer look like? Who will be able to communicate? So Tahu's a, a very strong communicator. And I think, and that's why that's, uh, you know, one of her strengths across not just her disciplinary knowledge, but her strength across a whole range of domains. And it is one of the things that I think that Māori are particularly well attuned for is transdisciplinary type research. It's been, you know, it's been a part of what we do is that we bring different types of skill sets and knowledge and share those. If we think about something like, uh, you know, Ngā Pai Ota Maramatanga, uh, New Zealand's, you know, Māori Centre of Research Excellence, that is this incredible um, conduit of, tra you know, transdisciplinary ways of thinking that sit within Te Ao Māori. But the actual forum is, um, th there's the space for contestation, and I think that's a really important element for people to realise that knowledge and science is a contested space, you know, that we, we have to keep working on it. So that contested element, the, the nature of the debate, the type of curiosity that comes out of just listening to people from very, very strong knowledge sets talk about those sorts of elements. And, you know, I've really enjoyed, which is a sort of, again, one of those opportunities that comes out of cri uh, over crisis and working with people that I probably wouldn't have had the opportunity or chance to work with without this. And it really shows, again, uh, at our level of work in terms of whether whatever the nature of the research is, whether it's social science, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, around the, we are much stronger when you bring the, at the interface of, um, of knowledge production, that when you bring different people with different knowledge sets, that's when you generate new knowledge. Mm. And so that's a very exciting space to be. And one of the things I've really appreciated about the, the network is uh, that, as you say, Tracy, you know, it's all about data, research, evidence, and a willingness to have your view changed based on what it is that you find, which obviously in politics is something that we need, we need to be able to do. Um, Tahu, has there been anything from the data or research or through this period that has surprised you? That's you know, spoken to that fact that we, we do need to sometimes change our mind based on, on what we see. Yeah, so I think most of the data that's been um, sort of generated in, la in the last four weeks has, has really been around um, very sort of tightly focused on um, the infection and on sort of mo the modelling of infectious, uh, infection fatality rates and um, spread and, and, and what um, and what fatality might look like under different kinds of conditions and scenarios. And, you know, that's been 
um, really useful and necessary. And I think, um, you know, people now know a, a lot more about epidemiology than they ever wanted to know before. <laughs> and who knows, there might be a whole sort of cohort of science of uh, high school students who want to be um, epidemiologists, <laughs> you never know. Yes. Um, so, you know, so most of the data has really been around that. But I think, um, and it's sort of early days, but I think go, moving forward as we move into the um, recovery and we start to look more at the sort of economic um, and social data and how that can be sort of best calibrated, I guess, to sort of inform and support particularly those community-driven responses. So what I'm hearing from the networks that I'm connected to, and particularly from iwi and hapu and Māori organisations, is that they've been able to respond rapidly, um, but not necessarily with all the information that they need at the right time. And that moving ahead, if they want to keep sort of exercising that leadership, they actually, they actually need the right data at the right time that's going to inform that leadership. And so, you know, for me, having been, I deal with data all the time, you know, I've been dealing with census data sets for a long time and also survey data. But one of the real opportunities, um, uh, is particularly in the Indigenous and Māori data sovereignty movement, is to rethink the ways in which we sort of design our data ecosystems so that Māori are right involved at the design space because if you have people involved and the communities involved in the design space, then you actually get the systems working in the way that you need them to and you're reaching the people that you're trying to reach. And so it just kind of makes good, good yeah. sense that you sort of, if you're going to do a redesign, that you have different knowledges at the mm -hmm. table when you're doing that redesign. And there is a huge appetite, having done um, hapu and iwi demography, you know, for at least 10 years, mainly using government data sets, but increasingly they want, their, um, you know, Hapu and Iwi want their own data sets, there is actually a really big opportunity to redesign the data ecosystem so mm -hmm. that data flows both ways, um, it's granular, it's relevant, and it's much more tailored to the sort of information needs on the ground. So for me, I think that's the big opportunity moving forward, is to connect that data um, to those who will be doing the action, delivering the policies, being on the ground, exercising yeah. the leadership so it actually works not just for government, but actually for communities as well. And that makes complete sense to me because I know every decision we've made, we've wanted to understand what, sits, what evidence that's behind this decision, what data do we have around how that's working already. It makes sense to me that at a community level, they'd want exactly the same. Yes. Tracy, anything that's surprised you or that you've grasped and grabbed and thought, this is actually something that we can really improve going forward as well? Well, we certainly know that the social and economic impacts are going to extend far beyond the health impacts uh, for, for a long period of time. So given that a lot of my work is particularly looking at inequalities, about ad uh, addressing those issues, yeah, this, uh, it's not that there's new things, but it's about really recognizing um, the different forms of knowledge coming from other places can make a contribution for that. We know we have to really think about the, the, the local decision-making. We need to be ensuring that at all those sets that it's a really informed, that's culturally informed, that it's adaptive, that it's flexible. And I think that that level of flexibility, the types of agility that we're seeing, the in, in, in amounts of imagination, particularly even with our rangatahi. So those that are having to stay, you know, uh, home from school, those that are having to stay home from university, we've seen some really strong rangatahi led movements about the way that they've taken ownership of their own learning and uh, you know one of the things when I was talking to Stuart McNaughton who's the Chief Science Advisor Education saying that in terms of the transition back to school to make sure we don't lose this innovation and ownership of their learning that many of our rangatahi have actually demonstrated and illustrated for us and so you know those are the sorts of those are those sorts of elements that I think are, are really significant but you know if I go back to you know, the, the sort of the area that that's really sits very deeply with me is that this is this this really opportunity for us to look as a nation much more broadly around the types of opportunities that they, they are and, you know again i've learned something from tahu a long time ago that you know the incredible gift that we have the thonga that we have that we have a young age profile amongst our maori and pacific in a largely aging population across many nations that are aging. What a wonderful gift that we have. 
mm. and having our young Māori and Pacific people, you know, having that young age profile amongst our, our Māori and Pacific uh, communities. And so it's ensuring there that the investment is right mm. to move forward. And, you know, again, sort of having thinking about what that means in terms of uh, uh, addressing the child poverty types of indicators, what it means to ensure that whānau are supported so that our children can truly flourish and, and, and then make that contribution and participation back. So it's so all of those elements to not lose an opportunity. I have one of my young um, women who's just an amazing poet um, who's spent a, really a lot of her young life, uh, far too young life, um, in prison. Um, and she's an amazing poet. And one of these, one of her poems sort of starts with, you know, maybe chances were never chanced and life never breathed me. Mm. And I think, you know, particularly when I sort of think about how we start, you know, the, the, ex, the declamation of Tihe Modi order, mm. what it means for a young Wahine Māori to say, you know, that maybe chances were never chance and life never breathed me. And mm. I think that we just cannot squander mm. the opportunities that we have to create real differences and to support people to be transformative agents of change within their own communities and to and for young children for very young children to realize that they can be change makers that the way that the world is much of it is socially constructed it can be both made and unmade and so i think that that's a really powerful message that our young people have brought to my attention once again. I was going to ask another question, but I feel like that's the perfect way for us to, to probably um, conclude our conversation. Um, because Tracy and Tahu, for me, the big challenge that you've just extended is for us to remember that our response can be a response that's unique to Aotearoa, that we cannot lose the opportunity that we have, that we must not just survive but thrive, and that what will, what will make us either succeed or fail will be the degree to which we involve everyone, particularly our rangatahi, in our response. So thank you both for the reminder of that, for sharing um, your knowledge and your expertise with us today, um, and particularly reminding us of the importance of a te ao Māori response too. Kia ora. Namahi. Namahi. Thank you both, and please join us again for another um, conversations through COVID-19. Uh, uh, our next conversation will be someone from our arts and cultural community. So I look forward to speaking with you all again soon.